Welcome to Sunday at 10. And if you're joining us for the first time, or you're with us every week, we're glad that you're here and you're very, very welcome. In these next few minutes, we hope that we're going to speak with God as we pray and hear from him as we read his word and reflect upon it. This is a space to be refreshed, encouraged and challenged by the God who's always there, who never changes and whose love for us is certain even in these challenging and uncertain times. So let's pray together. Risen Christ, your wounds declare your love for the world and the wonder of your risen life. Give us compassion and courage to risk ourselves for those we serve. To the glory of God the Father. Amen. John chapter 14, the first 14 verses. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. The disciple Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our reading today comes from John's Gospel, and it's great reading, often used in times of uh, funerals and bereavements, but also it's a reading of friendship and faith and journey and trust and as I sat back and reflected upon it, I was drawn to my memories of my childhood, which one, two of you might realise is several decades ago now, but it's still clear in my mind of those playtimes when, you know, your best friend would come up to you and say, would you want to come home for tea tonight? And of course, delighted to have me invite, I would say yes, not asking where she lived or even what tea was going to have on the table for us when we got there. However, Every time, without fail, when those invites came, I would travel to this destination, find the food there, have a great time of companionship, full of trust that was fully rewarded. And yet in this passage, you realise that Jesus is actually trying to allay the disciples free. We hear the conversations between him and Thomas, and then later between him and Philip. And so you have to really recalibrate and reset the scene because it starts just a little bit before our reading in that Jesus has just revealed to his disciples that he's the son of man. He's going to be glorified. And more than that, that he's not actually going to be able to take them with him to where he is going. There is going to be a time of separation. Now, you can imagine, as so many of us have recently witnessed, that separation is hard, separation from those we love. This COVID-19 uh, social distancing and safe responses has meant that for many of us, our families and friends have been at distance, at arm's length. Some of us have been able to see them and others not. 
And indeed, there has never been a greater use, I think, of digital technology, social media, and telephones. But in those days, none of that existed. And if your friend said to you, someone who had been your traveling companion for three years and beyond, and said to you, actually, I'm going to leave you now, and had also revealed to you that one of the other disciples was going to betray him, surely, as a friend, your immediate response was, I don't want to be separated from you. I don't want you to go away. I want to be around. I want to be part of your life, maybe even to defend you. But of course, Jesus then tries to put their minds at rest. And he says, trust me, trust in God the Father. And then he goes on to say, for I am going to go to him, to be in that place where there are many rooms, the house, the many dwelling place that my father is. And I'm inviting you in due course, not yet, but in due course after I have finished preparing that place so that you may come and join me. I've often wondered how it would have felt to have received that message. I'm going to go and prepare. Why? Why do you need to go and prepare something? We've traveled so much of that journey together. You can hear the disciples mulling it over in their minds. It's been ready-made. There's been times when there have been thousands of people around. They haven't even had food. You know, you've had that situations where there were 5,000 people and they had to make bread and fish go all around there not necessarily prepared in that nice, orderly fashion. Here then we have Jesus saying, actually completely the opposite to that. I'm going to go and I'm going to prepare a place for you. This would be the ultimate, wouldn't it? Long distant relationship. This is a time when your friendship is going to be truly tested. So Jesus tries to bring some sort of good foundation for their trust to be built on. And he reminds them of the miracles that they've seen and been part of, of the transformation when the learned have been seen new things revealed unto them, when overseers has been transformed, when tax collectors have actually turned around their lives and become generous with their own money rather than taking it from the needy, when women have been healed and beggars and blind people have been healed without discrimination, all beneficiaries of the trust and love of Christ that comes through God in a way that makes the whole world a better place. It is this that Jesus is drawing on when he says to his friends, his disciples, it's going to be okay. Trust in me for I'm going to this place. These risk takers have to understand it's a moment of step change, new beginnings, new opportunities. Now imagine you then begin to wonder, well, how can I be certain? I've seen the mission, the miracles, and I understand that they are truly unique. But of course, Jesus has another place. Having told them he's the son of man, he's obviously the commissary. He is the same person that God has entitled to fulfill the final covenant, the covenant which God himself began in the promises through the Old Testament. I'm reminded again and again about how God steps out boldly and reaches into us, even when we're going in the opposite direction. You only have to consider that moment with Abraham, when God had asked for him to sacrifice Isaac, and in obedience, Abraham had obeyed him. And then through an act of love, God says, no, it's not necessary. And in that moment of recognizing it is not necessary, God says to Abraham, as part of our relationship, I promise you that your generations of your family will be as many as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. There is a promise for each of us. So as Thomas is engaging this conversation with Christ, not knowing the way, we realize that actually the destination of promise is more than an earthly capital place. Here, Thomas is actually understanding and slowly crying out, not for the earthly instrument, but for the way in which he's been taught as a disciple. He can say, I do not know the way. But here, Jesus is reminding him that the way is not turning left or right, but it's a way of being, of living out that which he has been already doing as he journeyed with Christ himself. Trust 
belief and following, a deep-rooted learning which brings out miracles, makes really new transformations possible, leading to renewal in community, communities, a thriving body, directly and indirectly changing what went before. This whole journey of trust sharing actually moves on a pace and it becomes about equipping. No longer passive, Jesus starts to equip his disciples and as he explains to Philip, anyone who has faith in me can do even more than we've done already together. Once more, it is not the directions for the journey, but the being and the expectation of what that being must be. Reunited in friendship through action, not necessarily by presence, for God moves through Christ to bring new glory to humanity as well as to God the Father that humanity brings in glory. Jesus says quite clearly, ask in my name and I will do it for you. This is a real sense of the trust of friendship, the depth, the richness, that which has been loaded with honour and experience. An individual commissary now saying to all around him, this is your opportunity. You can speak with authority when you call on my name. You can do the invitations and do the miracles that may change the world. As we recognise this, so we are reminded that we too, through this, can see the invitation that is offered a friend unto a friend, to a house, to a safe place, not just for tea, but for, of course, for the final heavenly banquet. There is an essence of something which most of us will sing on Friday. Maybe the Dame Vera Lynch song, We'll Meet Again. Of course we will meet again. Not just, I pray, when this COVID-19 social distancing ends, but we'll meet again once we are restored with our Heavenly Father in those many dwelling places to share and relax in the ultimate tea event. May your Sunday be blessed and may this be a gift to you. Amen. Heavenly Father, at this time of anxiety for many and amid all of the uncertainty, we thank you for the eternal promises that remain true in you. For the knowledge that you promise to be present with all of us at all times, even to the end of the age, and that nothing, no difficulties, sickness, sadness, fear or doubt, can separate us from your love for us in Christ Jesus. We think also of those words from our Bible reading, words that assure us that your Son is the way to eternal life, the truth that makes sense of everything, and that in him is life in abundance. Where we are fearful or prone to worry for ourselves or for others, give us, we ask, a sense of your great love for us and an experience of your presence with us. Sovereign Lord, at this difficult time, with a pandemic that has spread across the whole world, we pray for the world, your world, and we ask that you look on it with kindness. May a vaccination or medical solution soon be found, and we ask that you might give wisdom, clarity of thought and sound judgment to our government, to those who advise them, and to leaders around the world. We pray for those, some known to us, who have been directly affected by tragedy as a result of the virus. May they know your comfort and be aware of that sense of peace that passes understanding and which only comes from you. Finally, loving Lord, we pray for ourselves. May we be attentive to your voice. Help us in this time when things feel so different to take the opportunity to spend time with you in prayer. Help us to listen to your still, small voice, to catch glimpses of your glory and to commit ourselves to reading your word and allowing you to shape our thoughts and perspective. So Father in heaven, accept, we pray, our offering of praise and thanksgiving, our prayers offering, offered in hope or from a place of fear. Still our hearts and minds and bless us, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. In the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you, now and always. Amen.